This video is going to show the benefits of flying a DJI Phantom. There are a lot of videos about DJI Phantom, but this one's designed to answer four main questions. What is it? Which one should I choose? How much does it cost? And how do I fly it? A DJI Phantom is a quadcopter, meaning a four rotor copter. It's made by the DJI company, who makes several different types of aircraft. Recently I began flying a Phantom quadcopter after several years of flying fixed wing RC aircraft. Anyone who's seen my YouTube videos knows that I have flown cameras on RC aircraft going back to 2006. I started with an Easy Star, quickly moved on to a Slow Stick which I stayed with for many years. I've always liked the slow stick for its ability to fly slow and smooth. That's the type of videos of landscape and scenery I've always tried for. A few years ago, I saw a video of a guy flying a multi-rotor copter down a path between trees and rising above a field. I was hooked. That was the control I always wanted to achieve in my flying and video. I made a few mistakes along the way, trying to find the best multi-rotor copter. And hopefully this video is going to save you a few headaches and show you a few shortcuts in choosing a great phantom flying machine. At the time I started looking into a quadcopter, I went to the local hobby store and purchased a DJI F550 hexacopter, six rotors. Some have three rotors, tricopter, some have four, quadcopter, some have six and even eight rotors. I still have my 550 with a fixed GoPro camera mount. After flying the Hex for a while, I wanted to try something a little smaller, a little bit more agile, something easier to travel with, so I moved into a TBS Discovery Pro. I lost the Discovery Pro in a recent business trip to Arizona in an unexpected flyaway in the desert mountains. The desert was kind of lush and really hard to find things, and plus it was very hilly, rocky, mountainous. Even though I had lots of help, we still couldn't locate it. There was a lot of money invested. I lost it all, along with my GoPro Hero 3 Black Edition. And at that time, I looked into the Phantom and found it had everything I initially wanted when I first looked into multi-rotor copters. The next step was to decide which one. Here's the Phantom 1. This is the first of its type that uses a generic LiPo battery. The props bolted on with nuts. There are several other differences, but I'll keep this brief. This is the next generation Phantom, the Phantom 2. This is the one that I have. It incorporated a proprietary battery with a much longer life, as well as a self-tightening prop so they don't unscrew during flight. Again, there's other improvements, but this is not the purpose of this video. Next up was the Phantom 2 Vision, basically a Phantom 2 with a proprietary integrated camera, ideal for someone who doesn't have a GoPro. And this model's been pretty much replaced by the newer version that you see here. This is the Phantom 2 Vision Plus. As of April of 2014, this is the latest version, much like the Phantom 2 Vision, but with an improved camera and a 3D gimbal. Check out the DJI website and several other YouTube videos for a more detailed comparison. Once you decide which one you want to buy, you may want your Phantom to be modified to include a number of options, such as FPV, which is first person view. That means you can look through the camera while you're flying the quad. Or OSD, on-screen display with telemetry. So it's going to have information like speed, distance, heading and degrees, altitude, pitch, roll, artificial horizon, speed of ascent and descent, and on and on. Or perhaps you want to mount a GPS tracker like I did. Maybe lights, larger props, all kinds of options to choose. These are all important options to consider. However, to make those decisions regarding your aircraft, you need to find out what your personal objectives are. Ask yourself these questions. Do you want to mount a camera? Do you already have a GoPro? Do you want a gimbal to hold the camera? And this is going to keep the camera steady as you pitch and roll and reduce vibration, or what's commonly referred to as the jello effect. Do you want to use your high-tech radio, like a Futaba or a Spectrum or a JR or other radios, has the capability of extending distance and programming with many options, like flying a number of other models, having additional switches that control a wide range of styles. This is usually the choice for RC enthusiasts who need multiple channels for lots of models flown by the same radio. However, for people like me, most are satisfied with the options offered on the Phantom radio. It's got course lock, return to home, 
a GPS mode or a attitude mode, all of which you can research by looking into the Phantom documentation or other numerous video tutorials on this subject. Do you insist on having the latest version? If so, just jump to the latest. By the time you hear this video, who knows what other type of models will be available. Do you require FPV? Do you use a monitor or goggles during your flying? Are you going to be flying around people? If so, it may be wise to have prop cards. Do you need a carrying case? How far do you want to fly? The reason I chose the Phantom 2 was in part because I had the following objectives. I wanted a remote controlled aircraft, of course. Reliable product, dependable aircraft, mounted with a gimbal, holding a GoPro, FPV with telemetry, reasonable distance, easy to travel with, smooth, high quality video for shooting hillside, landscapes, ocean views, etc. And most of all, I just wanted it to be simple, simple to operate. Choose your source very carefully. Make sure you have an agreement documented up front. Perhaps you have a trusted friend that's already knowledgeable in the subject. That's great. That's a real advantage. There are many that are watching this video that are more than capable of building your own creation. Go for it. This video is probably not for you. If what you see interests you so far, hopefully you can find someone that will listen to your objectives. Unfortunately, many are not willing to listen. They'd rather recommend what they think you should buy or what they want to sell you. If they can't sit and listen to your goals, shop somewhere else. Some people will buy the stock product and fly it right out of the box. I won't even begin to tell you the many places to shop for that product. However, there are some reputable suppliers that have a staff of technicians that are going to tailor your Phantom to your specifications. Be aware of pricing and availability, as well as if they are the kind of people you want to do business with. If you choose to buy a base model, you're probably going to be spending around $1,000. But if you order a custom Phantom with various options that we already talked about, it could go up to $2,000 and beyond. It all depends on what you want to get. There are a lot of people doing their best to stay within a budget, so they buy various components from a number of sources including parts they have in a box or parts they buy off eBay. Be careful about compatibility and reliability. I've gone the route of having a Frankenstein quad built for me and it led to a lot of problems. I was fortunate enough to find a supplier that sold a complete package for the Phantom 2 and this eliminated the risk of non-compatible components. Further, I knew it was being assembled by a company that does this for a living not experimenting on a design at my expense. I chose a source near Los Angeles I put together the Phantom 2 product that you see right here. The first thing I'll say about flying a Phantom, it's very easy to fly as long as you're in the GPS mode. Some people fly in the manual mode. This allows them to do aerobatics. The best way to learn the Phantom is to remain in the GPS mode. In this mode, it maintains a level attitude. Once the radio sticks are released, it stops moving and stays in the same attitude. Altitude. Location not drifting regardless of the wind. The attitude mode will keep the aircraft level but it has a tendency to continue moving in the direction that it's heading after the sticks are released. Don't misunderstand, it's not hard to have a problem and crash. The Phantom is no exception. By getting too close to trees or buildings then panicking can lead to a crash and it's a good principle to try to count how many successful flights you can fly without unexpected events. Once you are ready to fly, there's a few things to keep in mind to avoid crashes that can lead to damage to your Phantom and not to mention possible property damage and worse yet, personal injury. A friend of mine once gave me two words of advice that stayed with me. He said, use a pre-flight checklist and fly as though you were on that aircraft that you're operating. Good advice. When I head out the door on a Saturday morning to fly, I use a checklist to help me remember to take everything I need to fly. This way I won't forget something. This packing checklist is a strange acronym to help me not to forget what I need out there in the field. Power. Take your batteries. I take enough batteries to cover the amount of flying I plan on doing. I don't fly at a park with other people, so I don't take my chargers and spend the day out there with a the lawn chair. Unless I'm heading out of town, then I'll take battery chargers. I have batteries for the Phantom, a battery for my goggles, and extra batteries for the radio just in case. Second, antenna. Two main antennas are necessary. Now that I'm flying a Phantom, one is usually attached to the quad at all times. The other is mounted to my goggles or the monitor. The antennas that you see here are 5.8 covered cloverleaf antennas. The third is radio. Here's the radio that comes with the Phantom. It's simple, easy to use, and basic in selecting the options to fly. Number four, tester for the batteries. The Phantom 2 batteries have a built-in tester and display that same battery level during flight. Press the battery once and it'll show one to four bars to give you the assurance that remaining battery life. You can also see the battery life displayed on your goggles or monitor. 
if you choose that option. For my LiPo batteries that I use for the goggles, as well as the batteries on my hexacopter, I use this battery tester. It's great. Easy to check real quick to see how much battery life you have left. Next is camera. Nothing worse than going out without your camera. With the Phantom, I rarely dismount the GoPro, so I don't have to worry about that. But in the past, I used to go out and forget the camera, and I never fly without a camera recording anyway. That's just me. The last is eyepiece. I use a pair of Foxtech goggles for FPV. There's others like Fat Shark. If you're a Phantom Vision user, you might be using your iPhone or a monitor that came with your Phantom like I have. And this could be mounted to the radio. It's all what your style is. Just don't forget that piece of equipment, especially if you're flying FPV. Once you're out in the field, it's very tempting to get that thing up in the air as fast as possible, especially if the sun is about to set. If you rush the process, you may be in for a big disappointment. In the past several weeks leading up to the arrival of my Phantom, as well as since I've become a Phantom pilot, I've watched lots of YouTube videos. Seems like the most popular ones are the crashes. Check out a video that I posted on my channel that I called the personal best slow stick crashes of 2007. I crashed just like anybody else. Unfortunately, many of the crashes that I've seen on YouTube are not funny. Some narrowly miss people and property, while others crash into houses and buildings and cars. And there's a lot of discussions out there on what has been labeled flyaways. The big question is why? Why did my quadcopter go flying away unexpectedly? As I said earlier, I've had a few crashes myself. I've lost my uh, Discovery Pro. They can happen when you fly near high power lines, cell towers. Other happen due to faulty hardware and electronics. However, a great number of mishaps occur when the compass is not calibrated or the GPS is not connected to a sufficient number of satellites. I won't go into the process of compass calibration in this video. Please be aware that at times you need to calibrate the compass. And remember this, every single time you fly, you gotta wait for the blinking green light that indicates that the GPS is connected to a necessary number of satellites, minimum six. Here's a pre-flight checklist that I use. I've created this for myself just to help me calm down and think things through before I left off. Again, it's a weird acronym. It just helps me to remember the very important things that I need to do before I start the props. First one, radio. It's always best to turn the radio on before you power up the Phantom. Number two, extend the antenna up. Now this may not be as critical as some things, but if you point the antenna directly at the aircraft, you're not getting a good transmission of signal. It's better to have the antenna up at a 90 degree angle. In other words, don't point the antenna directly at the Phantom. Third one, GPS. After powering up the Phantom, you need to wait for the blinking green lights, indicating the Phantom has marked its position. That's your home point. If you lose a signal, if your radio is turned off, it goes into return to home mode, and it will land very close to the point that you took off. Without this, there's no reference for the return to home command. Letter I, index. I use my index finger to start my GoPro. So this is going to help me to remember to press record on my GoPro before I take off. You might be surprised how easy it is to take off without pressing the record button. The last one, switches. You have two main switches that you need to flip into the up position in order to take off. Now, you can be in a different mode, but for the beginner and for myself, I like both switches in the up position. This puts the radio in the GPS mode. Make your checklist so you never forget the necessary precautions. When you first begin to fly, just take it slow. Practice taking off and landing. Begin with short trips in an open field. Don't be in a hurry to go too far or too high. Get familiar with the radio controls. Live in what I call the what if zone. Continue to ask yourself, what if this thing falls from the sky? Will it land on a house, a parked car, or worse yet, a group of kids playing soccer? Have fun with it. Don't forget to put identification on your aircraft. I put my phone number on it so people can call me if they find it. And as for me, I chose to equip my Phantom with a GPS tracking system like this product here. Even if the power is knocked out of the quad, this self-contained GPS tracker will send a signal to my iPhone while I'm out there on the field or to my computer. If you found this video helpful, feel free to send a link to someone who's curious.